सो so, वही जो बस अंशु जो लिंक डॉक्टर सैंगर ने भेजे हैं वही फॉरवर्ड कर दू ना मनु को हाँ वही एक ही लिंक ही है सबके लिए ओके सो हाउ ही इज गोना शेयर हिज स्क्रीन सो ही विल हैव टू प्रेफरेबली हैव माइक्रोसॉफ्ट टीम्स एट हिज हैंड आई थिंक ही इज कमिंग यू कैन स्पीक विद हिम अमित हाय मनु अमित हियर हे अमित कैन यू हियर मी यस यस वी कैन हियर यू अ वेरी लेट गुड इवनिंग टू यू No thank you thank you for having me <laughs> So uh, we can just do a quick test Manu by if you can share your slides uh, I mean screen and yeah. you can just quickly go through Good morning Dr Khosla Morning uh, Amit and uh, good evening Hello. to Dr Prakash how are you I'm doing well thank you for having me Um so that's my screen so I'm assuming you can see right yeah we can see that no problem yeah manu if you want to just run one or two slides just to make sure it's working fine yeah i think it should yeah 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 i it think yeah. yeah yeah it's all good Yeah and actually before we start it would be very valuable to also just know a little bit more about the audience uh who do you think might be connecting and uh, I mean I know a little bit about the institute from you Thuli but it would be kind of getting a good context of who's connecting would actually be useful Sure uh, so Manu I will have my director Dr Sanjeev Khosla uh, let you know about the audience and um, and uh, Dr Khosla can you uh please uh, engage uh, manu and let him know yeah uh, hi uh, so uh, basically the audience would be a uh, lot of people from the scientific community 
mm-hmm. across not just the city but also uh, we've sent invites across india as well so there mm-hmm. will be there should be lot of the scientific community mm-hmm. as well as students uh, that may that's the major part of the audience basically we've also send and invite to a few uh, people from the society as well but uh, those are a few people but mostly students researchers and uh, other academicians yeah mm-hmm. and then does i'm tech has its own internal students as well graduate students or no yes 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 we we have we have uh, several of uh, them hopefully joining uh, through uh, uh, this ms teams as well as through facebook so mm-hmm. yeah so manu it's going to be telecast through youtube as well as uh, through facebook as well okay so then we don't know who's joining <laughs> yeah and uh, as i have re- i'm just informed by the it that uh, we are already live on facebook and twitter Sure. Okay. I just thought I'd update everyone. That's, that's good to know. That's yeah. Welcome everybody. We'll start in some time. So, it looks like you are still in lab. I am still in lab. That's correct. Yeah, I was running experiments, and I have, um, I have my timer set. I have to. S- stop a reaction at some point of time i can tell you exactly when in 5 minutes i have to do something and then i can uh, then i don't have to worry about it yeah i think just right now is a crazy time but you know in virtual talks uh, it's actually possible <laughs> there is no travel involved yeah it's been long times in the lab nowadays it just so yeah. it has really changed everything How are you all coping up? I guess life has been hard everywhere. Yeah. Are schools open in India? Uh, some of them. Uh, some classes have started, uh, and in uh, in some states, not everywhere. Um, so yeah, it's slowly uh, starting. Uh, some activities starting here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but the institute uh, students are not on campus no on campus wow yeah yeah most of them have now returned back to the lab yeah mm-hmm. we had a very short downtime uh, for most of the students uh, and uh, even those who went back home were able to come in quite quickly probably in 2 3 4 months time uh we have uh, been able to manage the student hostels that way um so uh, it's been it's been going on fine yes yeah, so i think we have around an hour and a half to begin so we should start then and just for you to know uh, i met uh, felix uh, Yes yeah, so it is officially 11 am so we can begin uh before we start i would like to request everybody on ms teams to please mute their end for the benefit of the listeners all right so 
A very good morning to all of you and good evening to uh, Dr. Madhu Prakash. Uh, welcome all to the 37th CSAR Intech Foundation Day. Uh, established in 1984, the CSAR Institute of Microbial Technology is one of the youngest research labs of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, which falls under the ages of Ministry of Science and, Science and Technology and Earth Sciences. We are led by the Honorable Prime Minister of India as the President of CSAR. And Intech is built on a 47-acre campus with world-class facilities in the domain of microbial research and biotechnology with industrial applications. As a tradition, on the Foundation Day, the Director of CSAR Intech releases the annual report and discuss Institute's mandate and future plans. And then we have the much awaited CSAR Intech Foundation Day lecture for which we invite eminent, eminent speakers from all over the world. Hello. And as all of us know today, Hello. we have a very eminent speaker with us, Hello. Dr. Manu Prakash from Stanford University. So I shall now request Dr. Sanjeev Khosla for his welcome address and narration of the annual report. Uh, thank you, Anshu. Uh, let me first share the slides. Uh, yeah, can people see the slides? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, welcome to everyone uh, on the 37th Foundation Day of Intech, and uh, it's an honor to be presenting the science report for uh, for Intech uh, this year. Uh, I won't take too long a time to present this report because I'm eagerly looking forward to actually listening to Dr. Prakash. And uh, uh, Intech, as Anshu told, started its journey in 1984. And uh, uh, this was uh, uh, hard work done by our founding director, Dr. Vora that uh, led to uh, the start of this Institute of Microbial Technology uh, with a vision to create translation ecosystem strengthened by fundamental discoveries. Uh, and the aim that he had was to build a world-class institute that uh, worked on several uh, things. Uh, one of the most important things that he envisaged was to work have uh, cutting edge uh, research on molecular microbiology and infectious diseases. He also uh, was the one who dreamt of a biorepository of microbial species, which we call as MTCC today. Uh, another important thing that he actually thought of was to have work uh, in our institute that would actually help the industry setting up the biotechnological uh, uh, work, uh, and that is where our uh, biochemical engineering fermentation uh, comes in, and also supported by data. All right. Uh, Anshu has already uh, spelled out about uh, uh, our infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, been working in various areas of basic research on microbial uh, technology. Um, uh, we are working on several emerging areas of uh, uh, microbiology, including microbiome, metagenomics, evolution, host pathogen interaction, and so on. Uh, we have also been keenly working on uh, ways of converting our basic research into services, and uh, the best example of that is our uh, uh, microbial repository, uh, MTCC, microbial type culture collection. Uh, we have also have a very strong fermentation group uh, and biochemical engineering group. Apart from that, we also provide services in animals, uh, uh, animals as well as instrumentation. We are also taking uh, baby steps into what we call as solutions, solution not just for academia, but also for industry. And again, uh, I will take up two examples of that uh, towards the end of the talk, where uh, we have actually uh, tried to provide 
solutions, uh, research solutions uh, to uh, informatization and biochemical engineering. Uh, as I said, uh, we have a very well established infrastructure, uh, both in basic biology as well as uh, uh, technology demonstration. Uh, we uh, uh, we have a group of around 49 scientists, uh, 35 of them are directly involved in research. Uh, the, these people are supported equally by administrative and technical staff. We have uh, more than 150 uh, students uh, um, as of today. Um, uh, and apart from students, we also have uh, uh, training programs where we train uh, several students from MSc and BSc in various aspects of, uh, uh, of science. And I want to point out uh, the program that we are initiating this year. One is a CSI Rimtech dissertation program where we would provide training to uh, students uh, in line where they are, uh, with their uh, departmental dissertation programs. We are also uh, uh, tying up uh, or uh, having uh, summer research uh, students uh, who would be selected by Indian Academies of Sciences uh, and uh, this would begin, uh, begin this summer. Uh, uh, let's look at uh, how we've been doing uh, uh, in uh, to in our research. Uh, on an average, we publish around around 90 papers. Uh, this year has been uh, similar. Uh, uh, this is just a, a brief uh, uh, depiction of some of interesting stories of what have come out of uh, IMTEC. Uh, this is from basic research. Uh, we also have an equal good uh, publication record from our translational work. Um, uh, uh, we are also looking forward to commercializing of some of the uh, scientific activities that we are doing and this you can see through our patents. Um, uh, we, uh, this is the patents that have been granted this year. Uh, these were uh, initiated several years back, but the, this year also we have around 16 patents that we have filed this year by several scientists in IMTEC. Uh, another way of looking at our research is looking at how many extramural projects we have got. Uh, we've got 33 projects from non-CSIR granting agencies including DBT, ICMR, um, and DST and so on. Um, and uh, worth around almost 27 crores. Uh, we several of our scientists have been actually uh, been award uh, been awarded with fellowships or have be, uh, been elected as fellows. Uh, some of our uh, faculty has also become members of national inst institutions like FSSAI or uh, Biodiversity Authority of uh, India. Uh, I'll come to uh, uh, spend two minutes on our service providers, that is MTCC first. So MTCC, as you know, is a repository of uh, microbial species, and we have almost more than 14,000 microbial species which, are, which have been curated and are available uh, from uh, MTCC. And uh, MTCC is also uh, 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 also helping in other aspects. Uh, um, so for example, this year in COVID times, we actually were mandated to become a biorepository of COVID-19 samples. We are also starting to actually uh, bring in clinical strains in the repository. But uh, as I said, we are also looking to provide solutions to, uh, to the industry and academia. And one such solution came from MTCC um, so ISRO has been looking at actually uh, uh, convert, uh, 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 degrading perchlorate, um, which is used as oxidizers in booster rockets and pyrotechnics, uh, and they have huge amounts of it. And uh, MTCC uh, 
was uh, 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 we had a collaboration with uh, uh, ISRO on this project and uh, quite proud to say that we we were able to actually provide them uh, two microbial consortia which which could actually degrade uh, perchlorate and now in the second phase we are scaling up these capabilities uh, the third phase is when we want to actually utilize synthetic uh, synthetic biological um, uh, biology to uh, uh, scale up further the second uh, service provider is biochemical engineering and fermentation division um, and uh, there we look at providing uh, uh, solutions or services uh, to take it to uh, the pilot uh, plant stage um, and in the last year we have taken several projects uh, and uh, uh, to help the industry in their uh, needs uh, again, we have been trying to provide solutions also to the industry. Uh, and one example from here is Dhampur Sugar Mills. Uh, so as you can see here, the problem that they came to us was quite simple. They had very low yield in alcohol fermentation and there was a lot of organic acid in the spend wash. Not go into the solutions what we were provided, and, uh, but you can see they're quite simple. So while it was quite simple for us to actually provide these solutions for them uh, to, uh, to the sugar mills, it actually provided uh, a lot more in terms of how much they could actually uh, uh, scale up their uh, efforts. So um, all in all, it's very important to actually be in uh, touch with the industry to provide them solutions. Um, Slides are not moving. Sorry, my slides are not moving. Ah, yeah. So uh, we have been able to uh, uh, do many collaborations uh, like this, and uh, this is just a summary of uh, the various MOUs and collaborations that we have started. I'll go to another solutions that we've been actually providing this year. Uh, uh, in the year where we had, we've been actually locked down in our houses and in our uh, institutes uh, due to COVID. Uh, but with the kind of infrastructure we had, we could actually very quickly uh, uh, provide help to the government uh, in providing the infrastructure to first set up COVID-19 RT-PCR testing. And this was way back in uh, end of March that we could actually start this up and uh, within 10 to 15 days of actually uh, we initiating this project, we were already testing samples and we actually served several hospitals, not just in and around the Tri-City of uh, Chandigarh, Mohali and uh, Panchkula, but also uh, several districts of Punjab, Haryana, and also Uttarakhand, which is a little far away from Chandigarh. Uh, and uh, uh, at one point of time, almost the whole of the institute was involved uh, in this testing uh, on, uh, 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 and so that uh, the burden of this testing doesn't fall on a uh, select uh, few people um, in the institute. So uh, I must congratulate all my uh, uh, colleagues, uh, scientists, technicians, students who actually helped in uh, initiating this uh, COVID-19 testing. Uh, apart from testing, we also provided training uh, to several institutes, uh, not just training, but we also helped in setting up their COVID-19 testing facility. For example, three of our uh, CSI sister Institutes, IHBTI, TR, and IIP, we were able to actually help them train. Uh, and you can see from the numbers, they've, they've been actually the backbone of testing in their own um, uh, uh, states. Uh, IIP, were, we even helped them actually set up the, uh, the facility because they didn't have a BSL-2 uh, lab, so we were able to do that. So all in all, we were able to very quickly use our infrastructures 
and uh, set up uh, help the government in actually setting up covid-19 rt pcr testing at imtech apart from rt pcr testing uh, several of our scientists actually were involved in covid related projects um, and these were individual efforts that were going on i'll just point out to three team projects that we actually took up uh, where several of the uh, imtech scientists were involved uh, one of them was uh, and which has actually gained a lot of ground in the last few months is antiviral testing activity so because we had our bsl3 facility we were able to quickly culture sars cov2 virus uh, we sequenced many of them and then established cell line based antiviral assays uh, now this was not just to test compounds but also to test various commercial products like copper foil emulsion paints uh, uv based appliances and so on and have actually helped several companies uh, from the uh, biotech as well as other industries in actually uh, testing the capabilities of various uh, 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 compounds and uh, appliances that the industry had and uh, uh, as as i had shown in my last slide more than 100 compounds we have tested and several appliances we have actually looked at um, apart from this we we are also we were also involved in surveillance apart from sequencing we were also uh, we took up uh, with in collaboration with punjab pollution control board uh, sewage surveillance so uh, the, the here we were also helped by the ccmb uh, uh, covid team um, where we actually looked at the presence of covid virus particles in the sewage in and around the tri city and we've been uh, working on this for some time uh, in addition to sewage we also actually uh, recently have uh, 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 been testing uh, air for uh, presence of sars cov2 virus and um, uh, using air samplers uh, we actually have actually tested air in various uh, places where we thought virus could be in higher concentrations like ICUs, COVID wards, and so on and so forth. And this has already come at, in the medical uh, med archives. Um, uh, so uh, this was the third activity that we took out. Uh, a corollary of this particular uh, activity was our interaction with another of our CSIR sister labs, CSIO, which is in uh, uh, Chandigarh itself. Who actually, so this here is an uh, uh, air sampler which we got from Sartorius. Uh, this is something that has been built by uh, CSIO and it is frugal and but as effective as what uh, the commercially available one uh, can do. This we now are using to actually scale up our efforts to detect viruses and test if uh, efficacies of various products and compounds like UVs and uh, ozone, etc., on in uh, BSL3 laboratory. So here, again, you can see this is the air sampler. This here is a aerosol uh, uh, chamber, uh, 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 air sampling chamber, and uh, when we we have connected it to a nebulizer which generates the um, aerosol and can be detected by this air sampler. So this now we are trying to actually see if we can actually utilize this uh, to uh, to see uh, the not only effect of uh, various uh, uh, compounds, uh, UV, etc., on uh, the on the air. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 aerosol, but also in collaboration with other sister uh, CSI sister concerns, um, we are trying to see if we can actually uh, give them uh, uh, demonstrate the effectiveness of these in uh, several um, uh, ducting facilities in various public places. So this is an ongoing work, but we are quite excited about it uh, because we can actually help the public 
um, in uh, in mitigation of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, with this, I'll come to uh, the last part, which is scientific outreach program uh, of CSIR. We've been, as I said, we've been training uh, several students and personnel in various aspects, uh, uh, basic biology, uh, animal house, horticulture, fermentation, uh, 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 various aspects of things that are going on in Imtech. Uh, uh, under the skill development program. Um, as I said, we've been uh, doing several of these programs. We've also been interacting with the students under Jigyasa program and uh, several thousands of the students we have been interacting with. Um, uh, even during COVID times, we were actually able to interact with lots of students and personnel uh, through webinars. So, uh, as all in all, we've been actually uh, trying to make sure that whatever we do in Imtech uh, reaches the society, and that's the main aim that we have in Imtech. And with this, I'll stop here. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you uh, for taking us. Uh, through the journey of Imtech last year, and I do share that you know we we all had this huge huge challenge in front of us, but I think as a team it was dealt very well. So yeah, proud to be a member of the Imtech family. So uh, moving on to the 37th Foundation Day lecture, uh, you know as you can see I really cannot hide my excitement. I'm so excited and honored to introduce the Foundation Day speaker today, Dr. Manu Prakash who is an Associate Professor of Bioengineering at the Stanford University. He did his B.Tech from IIT Kanpur and followed by a PhD from MIT uh, and then was for, uh, for three years was a Harvard Society Fellow before joining Stanford University. Uh, Dr. Prakash is very well known for his passion for basic science with development of affordable and accessible technologies. I have read in one of his interviews, he uh, said scientific tools are like pencils. They need to be accessible and ready whenever we want them. And I think this conveys his goal of democratizing access to scientific tools. And with that, he has developed the ultra low cost paper microscope, which we all know as Polescope, and the paperfuge, a 20 cent hand powered centrifuge. And believe me, when you look at his uh, lab's contribution, it's not just this, it's extensive, in depth science that is uh, backed in these applications. So it's important that we must listen to him and learn from what drives uh, his passion and how he really thinks. I'm really looking forward to that. And for his contributions over the years, he has received uh, several awards like the prestigious MacArthur Fellowship, HHMI Gates Faculty Scholar, National Geographic Emerging Explorer, NIH Director New Innovator Award, to name a few. There are many more. He is uh, the member of the Biophysics Program in the School of Medicine and Center of Innovation in Global Health. He is the Faculty Fellow of Stanford ChemEdge and affiliate member of Woods Institute of Environment. And not to mention, he has several patents and publications to his credit. And without uh, much uh, delay, I'm really proud and honored again to uh, present Dr. Manu Prakash for the 37th CSAR Intake Day Foundation Day Lecture on Frugal Science in the Age of Curiosity. Oh, thank you so much, Anshu. That was uh, very kind. Um, I'm assuming all of you can hear me. Uh, I want to begin by uh, just uh, mentioning how humbled I am to be invited, especially on such an important day for all of you. You know, uh, uh, the foundation and the beginning of many of these research institutions has been at the heart of uh, much of the scientific movements that we have seen uh, across uh, most countries. Uh, and I was just thrilled to hear the breadth of science uh, that Dr. Sanjeev just shared. Uh, you know, most often uh, uh, we read a class of papers uh, in piecemeal, when you really see that as an embodiment of a body of work done by you all as a group, 
I mean, it's it's just absolutely marvelous. And kudos to all of you. I know this uh, is a little bit of a moment of celebration, although not in person. We can all virtually toast a, a glass. Uh, I think science has been the backbone of response for this pandemic. And uh, it almost feels like as scientists, we've been overwhelmed. Uh, but frankly, I mean, hearing so many of the innovations that you all discussed, I mean, they're not just needed for India, they're needed around the world. Uh, and the fact that you all could play such a big role in such a short period of time is just remarkable. Uh, you know, I think uh, there are only two options when something like this unfolds uh, so dramatically. And it has been remarkable to see uh, the role of India and scientists in India, uh, to, you know, take this head on. And, uh, you know, you have uh, a pretty big population to protect. So, you know, there is a lot riding on this and we're not past this pandemic as well. So much of these, my hope is that many of these innovations and possibly what I'll end up talking about uh, that many ideas that arise and the speed at which we've all been able to work might shed some uh, light on how we should act uh, for the future, especially the kinds of partnerships and the eagerness to collaborate and engage uh, and really take on the challenges as they come along. I'm hoping post COVID, many of these will have a dramatic impact on many other diseases. You know, there is the pandemic and there are slow pandemics. So congratulations to all of you. Uh, I know it must have been a tiring time, but uh, you know this is probably a day to celebrate. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I wasn't sure uh, what I should discuss and talk about, uh, but maybe what I'll try to do is a brief uh, share through my own little journey of science and how I think about science. Uh, and I think maybe if there is any one message uh, that I want to give to all of you, and especially the young individuals in the audience, uh, because, you know, most of us who have been part of science long enough, we dedicate our life to the act of discovery and the kind of joy that you get coming up with the sets of ideas, implementing them. Uh, it is something internal and it's ingrained and I can't really change people's minds and opinions once they're already formed as uh, scientists. But I do hope that many of you who are beginning your journey of science might take a few sets of lessons in thinking about what you want to cherish and, uh, you know, what is the kind of horizon that you want to paint for yourself uh, in your future in science. Uh, I titled this Frugal Science in the Age of Curiosity primarily because I feel even in an extremely applied context, curiosity is at the heart of most of scientific innovation. And maybe through a few examples, I'll give you some backstories. Uh, maybe Anshu, I should ask you, how much time do you think I have in total? Just so I have a, a context for it. Uh, you have one full hour, uh, Dr. Prakash. So, yes. Okay, so I'll try to, you know, talk for maybe around 40 minutes or something and we'll try to turn this into uh, questions and discussions. Uh, so I think, first of all, uh, this is a little bit of a view of who we are as a lab. I like starting with this cartoon because you can tell I'm a scatterbrain. I am excited about many different things in science. And what I'll try to share and show you is a few sets of threads uh, but uh, remarkably, uh, the biggest joy in science is really the chance to work with young individuals, students across the board uh, who get a chance to join in in the lab and share your passion. So I think this is also a tribute to many of the individuals that uh, I'll try naming from time to time uh, that have been part participants in much of the work that I'll talk about. Uh, and let me begin by uh, this picture, this is one of my favorite children's book. And I have two young daughters, they're fairly young. And for, if you really have some very young uh, students listening, for me, at the heart of most questions in science is the sense of wonder. And it's hard to depict uh, that in words, but you can see that in the context of this picture. Uh, and much of the sets of technology Dr. Sanjeev talked about 
you know, at the beginning of most of those ideas was somebody scratching their head, thinking about, you know, how does this world work? And especially for many of us who are starting to bridge the gap between fundamental biology and implementation of biology for the service of society, this is really, it all has to begin. And so I'm hoping uh, if you haven't had the chance, go back, pick up some children's books from time to time, remind yourself why you got started in science, because if you have forgotten that, then it's very difficult to really come up with uh, unique new ideas. Uh, the second uh, children's book, which is my second favorite, which I would also highly recommend, uh, is, uh, is called The Giant Golden Book of Biology. It's another uh, highly illustrated children's book talking about the entire story of biology. And I think the reason I picked this just as an example I wanted to highlight is the surprising methodology that we have taken in science over the last 200 years. You know, there is roughly around nine to 10 million species on planet Earth. Uh, there might be even more than that. Uh, but when you think about fundamentally the types of systems we have tried to understand and the rules of biology that we have tried to build have been from the handful, maybe of five or six species. And to me, I find that quite surprising because it suddenly tells you uh, the limitations of biology. And of course, there are advantages of working with a few sets of systems, but you really cannot grasp the potential of biology unless you really connect that with biodiversity. I know Sanjeev mentioned uh, several sets of species banks and several sets of efforts in the context of biodiversity. Uh, if any of you are thinking about a career in science, one of my biggest advice is make sure you don't spend all your time in the lab, take the sets of tools and technologies that you've developed in the lab and bring them out to the field. Because this is really where the wonder of science unfolds and this is where we need you the most, uh, because ironically, uh, the set of environment that support life on this planet are degrading dramatically. So I think just one lesson I've always learned is to make sure that I'm taking the science that I do and the sets of tools and technologies that we built uh, to take them out, out of the lab in the context of the lab. Uh, I will just very briefly share uh, just side anecdotes. Uh, I was inspired by many of the basic science stories and I know many basic scientists might be listening. And if there is one goal in this talk, I'll try to weave through why I feel uh, the distinction between basic and applied science uh, is really broken. And frankly, as a scientist, uh, we have to think about both of these sets of two sides of the coin simultaneously. So all of you who spend enough number of time between one or the other activity, uh, I want you to think about the other side of the equation. So just very briefly, uh, most recently, we have had the chance to think about uh, uh, microbes uh, as machines. And one of the fundamental question that I've been thinking about for a long while is how do these microbial systems encode behavior? Uh, and especially this is a question that has been asked in neuroscience for the last 200 years, because we would like to understand how neuronal systems encode behavior. But you can take the same sets of examples, and we've been asking the same sets of questions, but in systems that seemingly don't have a brain, or uh, simply put, they are literally single cell organisms, and so they cannot potentially have the kind of complexity that you associate with neuronal systems. And I wanted to give you a little example of this before I dive back into frugal science uh, uh, to tell you why and how uh, we build the kinds of tools to discover many of these basic science phenomena. So here is a puzzle that I'll start with. Uh, this is an organism that we've been working on for the last couple of years. Uh, this is Lacry Maria Oler. And I'm just gonna play this video and you're going to watch in real time a single cell hunting. Uh, and what is remarkable about this video that you're watching is a single cell attacking, first of all, detecting, attacking, and literally engulfing another uh, organism, another single cell. But all of that behavior is actually encoded in the cytoskeletal dynamics of this. This is a real-time video. And one of the things that often enough when you think about basic biology, 
uh, we could argue for hours about, you know, where are all of these sets of ideas and algorithms almost embedded in a single cell. So often enough, and again, for many of you who work on microbial life, uh, you might have already realized this. Uh, you know, when you think about single cells and when you think about microbial life, nothing at this scale is simple in any way and form. And we know so little about how evolution acts on these systems to really encode these remarkable and complex behaviors. Another example of a discovery that we recently made, uh, which actually was done with a full scope, uh, and then uh, I'm going to jump to the more applied sides of the story, uh, is a story of uh, communication between single cells in what we believe is one of the fastest contractile activity in a single cell. Uh, this is from a ciliate called spirostoma. I found this in a swamp uh, nearby our lab. Uh, and looking through a full scope, uh, we made an observation that was quite puzzling. So I'm going to play this video and you can watch on the very top the time scale. It says zero milliseconds and keep an eye on the time uh, and observe this behavior. And what you're watching is a single cell contracting roughly in five to 10 milliseconds. The reason this is remarkable is this object, which is a single cell, roughly displayed the kind of velocities that are as fast as almost half a meter per second uh, and accelerations that can be literally 20 G or higher. And one of the remarkable aspects of this is, you know, we have often thought about cells and single cells to be these fragile objects, while here's a single cell demonstrating <laughs> remarkably almost in some sense an extreme nature in its activity. So we've been studying this activity for a while and we made quite a puzzling discovery. Uh, this is now, we brought this organism back to the lab and when you take the ciliate and you let it swim around, you notice they start clumping together. So now this is a cluster of many of these cells uh, and you're going to watch, I'm going to drag it at a little bit at a later time, uh, at some point of time, they have realized that they're forming a cluster and we started noticing uh, an activity that happens right there. So there was a little pulse uh, in this cluster of an activity. Now, you know, you might observe something and put that aside to say, huh, that's interesting. Uh, but there is a remarkable paradox hidden in here. You have hundreds of cells that could interact with each other in a couple hundred millisecond, how is that possible? And once you observe this activity in high speed, something really remarkable is happening. What's happening is that these single cells that are embedded in just a fluid are talking to each other via hydrodynamic waves. So a communication channel is being set. So I'm drawing these artificial lines that are traveling from one cell to the other as a context of a signal. But interestingly, this is a mechanical signal that is propagating through this colony of cells. And remarkably, this is roughly half a meter or a meter per second. So no chemical diffusion, no quorum sensing, uh, no chemistry purely could actually explain this behavior unless you evoke this idea that these cells are literally mechanically communicating to each other by sending a little shock wave almost into the fluid when they contract. And hence, the capacity of contracting remarkably fast. So these sets of contractions, when they occur, they generate a little pulse in the water, and that is sensed by another cell as a shear, and that triggers what we are calling hydrodynamic trigger waves. This is the first example of a discovery of purely hydrodynamic communication in the context of trigger waves. And many of you, if you have ever seen howler monkeys or many larger animals when they see a threat, they will generate these types of cascaded communications. You could really assume this to be a new kind of a communication, except it's happening at a single cell. And what I find remarkable and what I wanted to show you was uh, the fact that literally in 2020, sitting with a tool like Foldscope in a swamp, I am able to observe something that just has not been observed in the history of science. 
And that is a lesson for us to think about not to uh, presume what we know and what we don't know in science and really be open minded about it is unclear uh, as long as you're prepared. Uh, a one single observation might just fall in your lap uh, that really opens up a new door in terms of thinking about how does biology actually work uh, in the context of ecology and uh, ecosystems. So I think this is just a lesson for me personally. This has happened many times in my own life, uh, but often enough when we read the sets of stories and papers, we don't realize that most of those papers have some very humble beginnings. And this paper actually uh, was uh, uh, just uh, spending some time in a swamp looking at what comes your way. Uh, one of the other aspects that I want to highlight for many of you who are starting a career in science is to pay attention to a broader group of skills. You know, in the old days, you could think about science in silos, but that really has changed dramatically. Uh, this is a moment in science where you truly need both mathematical and physical and biological and molecular tools and ideas to make progress on any question. So it's extremely important that if you can get a chance, expose yourself to physical and mathematical ideas, because sometimes to truly generalize many of the principles that you would like to study, even at the smallest scales of uh, molecular biology, will require mathematical and physical insights. So take the time, learn and of course collaborate with your colleagues across the aisle uh, uh, that are much more inclined towards physical sciences. But it's incredibly important to do that if you want to make original discoveries. OK, so I'm going to skip and jump to uh, jump to what I really want to talk about. Uh, and I think one of the perspectives of this is I want to give you a very brief uh, philosophical view into what I think uh, of frugal, frugal science and what is a philosophical framework that I use when I'm applying to the sets of ideas. As you will notice, uh, you know, for me, there is a very smooth transition between applied and basic ideas. Uh, but the backstory of this starts with, you know, I grew up in India. I've uh, done uh, most of my undergraduate in India and growing up. I often felt uh, the need uh, to explore because it's just so ingrained. But often enough, it was in the context of lab exams or in the context of preparing something for the teacher that was prescribed. Uh, and I, I really felt exploration was not integrated in just our uh, learning experience. And I think that has stuck with me for the last 20, 30 years of my life to really think about why is it that the most fundamental and the probably most important skill that we have, which is our own innate curiosity, we don't get a chance to experience. And when I started my lab uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, it was a commitment that I made personally that I'll spend 50% of my time building and deploying tools and sharing them with people around the world. And what has been truly a remarkable journey uh, has been how much I have learned through that process. The remarkable individuals <laughs> like Thule, Mahek, and many other folks uh, back in India that I've had the chance to work with in this context. Uh, how much they have taught me along the way, and especially how much it's opened my own horizons of what I believe science actually is. So I'll share with you a few sets of reasons for why you should be excited and thinking about cost as a very important parameter if you're starting to think about building and designing with biology. So one of the contexts is, of course, uh, you can think about the term itself. Uh, the simplest way I think about is drawing every project that you drew, draw and work on. Try drawing this two axis plot of performance versus cost. And cost here is on a log scale and you can draw performance. The goal or the name of the game is to really not have a very big hit in performance, but really bring the cost of a given technique dramatically. And the reason it's important is uh, one order or two orders of magnitude reduction in cost might be the difference between a billion people 
or a couple thousand people actually exploring and using the kinds of tools that you build. So it's integrally important that if you're thinking about this, to think about this from the very beginning. Uh, the other reason is to really look at the inequalities on our planet. Uh, I remember taking this picture when I was traveling in Ghana, and this represents a picture of a hospital in a malaria prone area. And it bothers me often enough when we think about that, frankly, independent of where you live around the world, whether that happens to be a metro in Delhi or uh, a rural place in India, or it happens to be a, a rural county in the US, uh, access to health is uh, unequal. And this is the harsh reality for most people around the world. And one of the things you have to think about, especially because biotechnology has such an important role to play. And again, you know, the pandemic teaches us quite a lot in that space. How do you really think about making healthcare accessible to everyone? Uh, most of the time I end up working in places and areas where access to traditional infrastructure is not available. Uh, especially, uh, for example, uh, this is a field site that we work in Madagascar, uh, where literally for me to reach the community that I'm trying to work in, in the context of malaria, it would take me 12 hours to walk there. So you can imagine there is no electricity, no running water, and I still need to run a malaria test. I still need to bring the set of healthcare uh, facilities that you might assume and would like to desire for any population. Uh, and interestingly, when I started working on the question of healthcare over the years, it started occurring to me that education is the other side of uh, the same challenge. Uh, often enough, we found that sometimes working in areas around the world, uh, the fact that science and acceptance of medicine was not so common led us to really think hard about what are we trying to teach in the context of education that prepares people for this type of an exploration. Uh, and again, you know, in the context of education, if I was to put a point on this, uh, and again, this is a little bit depressing, So, but I need to state this because I want you all to be aware of the class of challenges that we are facing collectively. There is roughly around 2 billion kids on this planet, and probably out of those 2 billion, a billion would be by uh, UNICEF standards, uh, would live essentially under $2.5 per day or less. That would be the poverty line. So we are talking about half of the talent on this planet essentially not having access to any tools of curiosity. And that's a big number for all of us to think about when we think about education. Uh, and then finally, the third pillar for frugal science and why we need to engage at a very large scale is a massive destruction that we have caused as human society in the name of progress. And I would say overall there has been progress. The number of people that have lifted out of poverty and the lifestyles have changed, but it has been at a tremendous cost. And that cost is associated with many ways to look at it. Here is an example of the last 30 years of studying global biodiversity loss and literally three quarter of all flying insects in nature reserves across Europe have actually vanished. And ironically, we don't understand the fundamental reasons behind this. And frankly, if somebody was to conduct a study like that in the US or in India, you would find similar numbers. And this should be horrifying and worrisome at all scales, because this is starting to hint towards large scale ecosystem collapses. And again, you know, a few species here and there can recover, but when you're really talking about three quarters of all species in a given area at a large scale, uh, it's quite worrisome. Um, and I think the same thing could be said about much of what we do to our planet and the amount of pollution that we put in. One of the things that has me worried often enough and I'm thinking about is the role of microplastics itself and the fact that we don't know and understand 98% of all plastic where it goes. I mean, it's a remarkable thing to think about that an object that we use on a daily basis, we do not know its life cycle to 98%. And that's a very large number. And of course we believe it's somewhere in the ocean, but it's not in the top surface. And if it's not in the top surface, remediation and removal of this is a very hard problem. And the reason, 
reason I'm highlighting a few of these problems is I want several of you who are young enough to have enough mileage in you to really take on these large scale problems and ask yourself, you know, what is the kind of problem that I want to work on for the next 50 years of my life to actually make a difference? And this has nothing to do with where you end up working. This has nothing to do with what kinds of institutions. It has nothing to do with the kind of journals you will write papers along the way. It has to do with are you honest about tackling a problem that is real and you have the audacity to take these large scale problems. And I think one framework to be thinking about these, these are all I'm highlighting planetary scale problems and they require planetary scale solutions and hence the context of frugal science. No single scientist sitting in one place will be able to tackle these types of environmental and ecological problems. We really have to think collectively. And then the last one, uh, I don't want to make this uh, conversation too political, but unfortunately I have to say this in the middle of the pandemic, the fact that we are still fighting this philosophy of anti-vaccine and just, I mean, this was, I made this slide long time ago before the pandemic itself. This is just a picture in uh, US itself. Uh, the, the, the context of disinformation and what literally floats around in WhatsApp and leads to people literally mistrusting our uh, fundamental uh, pillars of science uh, is probably one of the biggest challenges that we all have to face even beyond the pandemic. And I think again, one of the things that I often think about is to tackle challenging like this, you have to really make the experience of science and the process of science more accessible. For people to trust the kinds of discoveries that could literally save lives, you really don't just have to bring the evidence, you really have to bring the process to the table so other people can experience this as well. So I am going to transition to now this was the gloom and doom. I wanted to share this gloom and doom because this is what keeps me up at night. Uh, the three pillars of thinking about health, education and environment. Uh, and I'm going to transition to tell you a little bit about that all is not lost and I have a lot of faith in the scientific community and the scientific enterprise at whole. And I'll share a few examples of things that we have been doing where I felt a sense of pride associated with bringing these sets of tools to people. And I want to premise by saying much of what I'm talking about has nothing to do with developed or developing countries. These are global challenges but it does have to do with haves and have nots. So if you walk out of Chandigarh and you look around even in your own town, you will find communities that have a lot and communities that don't have much. And I want you to think about science in the context of people who uh, fall into the have not category. So don't think about this in the context of some far away place, think about it in your own neighborhood uh, but you will find there is a tremendous divide between haves and have nots. So let's begin by uh, looking at how could we tackle these issues. One principle of uh, these sets of issues that I describe is that they operate at the scale of the planet. And so if we are ever to think about class of solutions that will make a dent in this, you really have to think about a planetary scale solution and especially from my context what I focus and think about are measurement tools. Could we measure biology at the scale of the planet? That's been really what we have dedicated the last 10 years of our lives. And the second aspect of this which is as important as the technology is can we build an inclusive environment which is true collaborations between amateur and professional scientists. And I think this is a very difficult thing to implement and think about because often enough as scientists, we have incredible biases. We believe we can do something and others can't, or we believe that we have the capacity to observe something while others can't. And that's truly misguided because many a times from the history of science itself, many incredible key observations have been made by individuals that did not have any formal scientific background. So it is truly a collaboration between professional scientists like many of you and amateur curious people who have the passion to observe their environment uh, is really when we'll be able to bring these solutions together. So let's 
look through uh, what might these solutions look like. And I often turn to the history of science to look for these solutions. And the picture that you're watching is if this was an interactive session, I would have you guess what you're looking at. And maybe some of you can think about what you're looking at. Uh, but this is a picture of Sputnik, an object that changed the course of science, uh, primarily because it started the space race. Now, what's very interesting about this object, and many people don't know, is when Sputnik was launched, we did not have the capacity to map satellites in the sky. So for example, any could anybody could have said, not just Russia, that, hey, we have a satellite floating around which is observing you. There was no method, no method to be able to track a satellite in space because space is a big place. And Fred Whipple, a very famous astronomer at that time, had been thinking about this problem. And right around the time when Sputnik was launched, he launched what is the world's largest and the oldest citizen science program in astronomy, and actually all of science. It was called Operation Moonwatch. While the Defense Department was spending hundreds of millions of dollars building these automated tracking satellites, especially the Baker Nun satellites, he envisioned what if he could give an average person a $10 telescope but truly really train them how to observe a quadrant in the sky and report quantitative data. Could you truly map the sky to track satellites and collect the kind of data that has never been collected before? And it turned out uh, the, the individuals won. It took 30 more years for the defense industry to be able to come up with automated trackers, but by that time, Fred had launched the world's largest. Tens of thousands of individuals around the world were exploring their skies, reporting quantitative data, and majority of the later Sputniks were actually observed by these individuals that had no training in science and many a times had, uh, you know, uh, professions uh, that were very far away from science. And I've taken this as an example to think about what is the equivalent of this for biology. And much of what I'll talk about is how do you enable hardware and software and people solutions to really observe our planet at a very granular scale. And I would argue the world's largest citizen science program that has been undergoing for literally hundreds of years is the community health worker. So what you're looking at on the right is a picture from Liberia. This is a, a healthcare worker from Last Mile Health heading out with a backpack on her back into the forest looking for Ebola. And, you know, many of us did not observe the kind of uh, exposure that Ebola would have caused if not for the work of many of these community health workers that went in with very little tools, literally into a, a a fairly dangerous situation, but we're able to curb, trace and track and bring the kind of scientific discovery to the last mile. And one of the things that I often think about is if you look at WHO's numbers, this is trillions of dollars of subsidized health care that is being provided to the world. And from a context of the pandemic, this is really the reason why we don't have pandemics more often than we do. And it's incredibly important to think about, and much of what you will hear about, is remember these community health workers and think about what is the class of tools that we can provide them to make their lives better, to really be able to bring the kind of science that they would like to do at the last mile, and to really bring cutting edge science to places where science has not come before. And I wanna talk about a few examples. I will give you this very, very briefly Rather than talk about the details, uh, much of this work is published. I'll share a few sets of examples and what I've learned through in the process of discovery through most of these. Uh, all of these examples will land either in science education, diagnostics, technologies, and much and more recently in ecosystem surveillance. And much of this is published. You can find this on our site. So I apologize, I'm already realizing I've lost half my time, so I'm going to go exponentially faster in this talk because I want to cover up some philosophical points. So this is not supposed to be an in-depth review, 
but just uh, an advertisement for you to go read these papers and of course many papers in the space. So let's start with uh, the idea of uh, how do we come about uh, working in the space. Uh, we spend a lot of time in the field and I think this is incredibly important as was also highlighted in the report is that you really have to interact with the people who are handling and dealing with these problems on a daily basis. Uh, I spend a lot of time in the field and because of that I get a chance to explore and learn about new questions uh, that I was not exposed to in the past and that acts as the, uh, a collaborative starting point for what are the important questions that you would like to come up with solutions. And you know the sugar mill was a great example to me because I remember growing up right next to sugar mills and there are hundreds and hundreds of questions that you can think about literally in the context of that one single industry alone. So expose yourself to the class of problems that you're excited about. Um, I want to mention a word about COVID. Uh, it, it was a fascinating, terrifying, and almost an exhausting journey. The reason I'm in the lab right now is because I've been running assays uh, literally late at night. Uh, and one of the things uh, that has been true for me is to think about COVID as really something inside, uh, you know, a pandemic inside a pandemic in some sense. Because one of the important aspects of this is we have had to invent technologies in a crisis mode. And frankly, that crisis is very time sensitive. And often enough, of course, we invent technologies, we take the time, we deliver them to industry, we ramp up and we scale. But the pandemic doesn't give us time. And it has been a remarkable experience to literally accelerate many of the methods that we develop and deploy, uh, but do that in a manner that can rapidly respond to the exponential increase of this virus. Uh, I've had the fortune of building several products in the scale. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any of these. Many of these websites are online all the way from uh, new kinds of PPEs, to manufacturing methods for local manufacturing of PPEs, all the way to full-fledged ICUs and many home diagnostic tests. And one of the lessons, I'll just share a few lessons that I learned during the COVID time in applying the principles of frugal science to COVID. Uh, and I think the first principle is that there is light at the end of the tunnel. So this is the first, uh, when I learned about this, thinking about a crisis mode, uh, historically, you might think about uh, the connection between volcanoes and bicycles. So it turned out in 1815, there was a very famous volcanic eruption in Mount Tambora. It created a large crater and it literally had a shadow on Europe for many months. Before that time, we only used to use horses for transport. And because of a large famine, many horses died. And around this time, Baron Carl von Drace, who realized this problem, started thinking about mechanized machines to be able to travel. And he built the very first example of what we now call bicycles. You know, when we came back to normalcy, of course, the famine was gone, but suddenly there was this new object that existed. And of course, the rest is history. We know and understand the power of this object. So sometimes when you're looking at the negatives of this pandemic, remember that the post pandemic world was not going to look the same. And in our crisis, we have to be our best to really be able to bring the class of technologies. You know, molecular diagnostics will never be the same again. And actually for that, we have to thank the pandemic because we also realize how unequal the access for molecular diagnostics has been. And how do we really tackle this in a wholesome manner? And to me, I've often been envisioning what are the bicycles for our pandemic. The other lesson to think about really is around collaboration. Uh, this is a picture that uh, someone sent me that showed up in a French, uh, a cartoonist had drawn about some of our work with snorkeling masks as PPEs. Uh, one of the remarkable things about the pandemic was sharing all of the work openly. And I think this was a new model for science where literally our data books, our lab notebooks, all were just openly shared on Google Docs. And literally 
hundreds of communities and teams around the world were implementing and engaging and collaborating across to take the class of solutions that we were trying to prove work, but to bring them to people and users around the world. One of these collaborations with the French team actually led to uh, roughly around 30,000 of these masks being deployed all across France when they were at their peak, which would be roughly equivalent to 4 million N95 masks uh, because this is a reusable PPE solution. And at the heart of all of this was primarily our openness to make sure that all the work that we do was openly shared. Uh, I'm going to skip much of this. Much of all of the COVID work is actually published. Much of this is on the websites. Um, let me just talk about the idea around people. I think uh, this is some of our work associated with ventilators. Uh, We've had the chance to build a very large scale consortium to think about how do you really bring open source philosophy and open source hardware to the medical world? So this is part of a consortium that we started with three universities across US, but also manufacturing partners in India, Kenya and Nepal with a goal of bringing ICU ventilators to communities where we just have never had ventilators before. But Something new in this is the perspective of open source hardware for critical care instruments. And the way you should think about this is think about the browser that you are literally watching this talk with is probably a Chrome browser or many of the Microsoft browsers. They're all based on a reference browser design that was released by Google a long time ago that's completely open source. And the idea is could we really implement medical devices with clinical validation and safety as a reference design that local manufacturers that have never had the chance to go through the biomedical process of building up these sets of products can learn and build enterprises and uh, industries to really be able to build high quality medical devices, especially to communities that have ne never had the chance to see. So this is one example of what we call pufferfish, which is one of the ICU ventilators that we've been working on with uh, an industrial partner, Bharat Forge in Pune. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna now jump through a non-COVID sets of examples, uh, just very briefly. Uh, I am excited about turning this into a conversation, so let me go a little bit faster. So, uh, uh, Anshu mentioned the idea around uh, paperfuge. I uh, just wanted to tell the background story. This picture is at the heart of uh, the history of how I conceived a uh, paperfuge, which was this conversation with a healthcare worker who told me about a centrifuge that they'd been using. Of course, centrifuges are at the heart of many uh, sample preparation processes. Many of you use them every day. And what he showed me is a centrifuge that was around two to $3,000 just sitting in his clinic, but he had never had electricity for the last five years. And on the flight coming back, I was thinking about you know, how can we do this with purely human power? And as my mind wanders, it wandered towards toys. And what I started thinking about at that time are spinning toys, including yo-yos. So this is, you know, one example, and I'm sure many of you have played with these toys before. Uh, that's a yo-yo, and this is a, a postdoc in the lab playing with this. And we asked ourselves a question, uh, could we start looking at all spinning toys? And we literally bought 30, 40 spinning toys. Uh, and in the end, we stumbled upon this thing called button on a string, which you can see on the very right, which is far more stable than many of these yo-yos. Uh, and one of the interesting aspects of this was, uh, this led to the discovery of Paperfuge, is this toy that we've all played with. I'm sure many of you have taken a Coke bottle cap, drill two holes in it and, you know, put a string and spun around. If you haven't done this, you should try it. Just be careful, uh, but you should definitely try it. Uh, what we discovered along the way was this was the oldest toy in the history of mankind. And ironically, although this is the oldest toy that has been discovered in all cultures again and again, nobody had asked a question of how does this actually work? And going back to my analogy to relying on mathematics. This is how it works. It took us six months to figure out how it works, but once we had figured that out, we could literally build 
the world's fastest spinning object with human power. So at this point, we hold a world record uh, with this object. You can go all the way to 120 to 150,000 RPMs just using human power. You know, within 90 seconds, you can extract pure plasma to do an anemia test. Using uh, many of the Buffy coat methods, you can extract single parasites, for example, a single malaria parasite that you can then observe with microscopy. And of course, the power of this is to take it back to the sets of communities that I was talking about. So this is a village chief in Madagascar, uh, the exactly the same village chief that I had mentioned before on my journey. And, you know, the lesson here is how do you translate from a question to a wild idea, which we had not imagined would actually work, translating it with basic science and fundamental science all the way back to the community that inspired that question. And most importantly, when we released uh, Paperfuge, it inspired hundreds of groups around the world to start building their own versions. We released all the sets of files. Now there are several tests that people have built on top of this. There are several versions of these, including uh, many of the new toys that have come out in that same space. Uh, and one of the contexts of this is really starting to think about providing people platform so that they can build upon uh, the kind of work that you do and share that work as quickly as possible. And when COVID happened, we actually realized this and we released a COVID test primarily based on a hand-powered centrifuge, which ended up becoming the first completely electricity-free test which was a molecular test using amplification, just using hot water and centrifugation. And one of the contexts of this is this allowed several sets of groups around the world to really replicate these kinds of work, especially for diagnostic that's happening not in a lab setting, but in a community itself. I'm gonna jump to talking about briefly about mosquitoes. And uh, some of you have known about our work on acoustic tracking of mosquitoes. Uh, this is shifting from not thinking about human diagnostics, but how can we bring diagnostics to an ecosystem scale? And very much like uh, the kind of sewage surveillance that's necessary, we really have to survey where do viruses hide. And so we've been thinking quite a lot about mosquitoes in this context. And of course, many of you who have thought about this problem know this. There is a tremendous number of mosquito species on our planet. And if you were to catch a mosquito right outside, it is pretty damn hard to know what species you just caught, even if you an entomologist. And I think one of the ways to tell this is I call this a mosquito bucket challenge, uh, which is here is a postdoc who is uh, in Australia who's exploring a catch of mosquito with tens of thousands of mosquitoes. And they are literally one at a time observing them under a microscope. I remember being in Thailand looking at hundreds of entomologists sitting under a microscope dissecting and identifying mosquitoes. And it occurred at that moment that there had to be a better way. We came back and that's when we built a buzz, uh, which is an acoustic recorder for essentially measuring mosquito species. Uh, and one of the things is it literally uses your cell phone. So you can go online on a buzz.stanford.edu, uh, look at the methodology for how to record, and just using acoustic recordings actually identify mosquito species. We have very recently uh, released a paper on bioarchive on how to do this for mosquito uh, molecular detection and especially the viruses that they might be carrying. Now, this is a little bit harder. This is work with uh, a postdoc, Shalab uh, Kumar and Felix in the lab. Uh, and we call this idea vector chip. And the aha moment here was thinking about how can we use mosquitoes as flying pipettes and let them deposit saliva into microfluidic chips. So what you're watching here is a quick video of this process. We have labeled our mosquitoes uh, with a fluorescent dye and right there, I think it's a little bit hard to see, but right here, if you notice, there was a single drop of saliva that was deposited in this chip. Right there was another drop deposited and now, what for the first time, we can detect and identify pathogens that mosquitoes might be carrying in a single bite. And the reason I'm so excited about this is for the last 100 years, and literally 
from the discovery that Ronald Ross made in India that we have mosquitoes transmit many viruses and of course malaria uh, is we have been using very crude tools and we have never had the chance to know how many virus particles are actually injected by a mosquito when a mosquito makes a bite. And so we developed this into a type of a pipeline that allows us, uh, this is what the chip looks like, and these chips are navigated by mosquitoes, and in this process that they're depositing and biting into single wells, we call these bite maps, and these bite maps we can essentially run uh, quantitative PCR or many other molecular assays. And I'm just gonna jump to show you what that actually looks like. So this is now data for Zika, where we have taken a population of Aedes aegypti, we have infected them with Zika, and each one of these wells for when a bite is positive, lights up uh, both for the RNA, but also we discovered along this way that when mosquitoes bite, there is enough DNA from the mosquito itself, possibly from the salivary cells, that we can also identify which mosquito bit that well. So we possibly have a solution here where we might not have to ever catch mosquitoes. This would be something like a little business card or a sticker that you would stick outside your home, let it let mosquitoes bite for a week. Uh, we bait these cards by human odorants, ship this to a central facility, and you would know a map of what is the probability that you might actually have infectious mosquitoes in your neighborhood. And of course, tr how do you translate that to human behavior change? I'm gonna jump to talking very briefly now about microscopy. Uh, and of course, uh, to talk about microscopy, I have to share this picture. Uh, for me, my journey into microscopy began when I accidentally ran into this picture at Sevagram uh, in India. And I was puzzled by this photograph by, for many reasons. And historically, there's a, still a little bit of a confusion whether uh, Mahatma Gandhi here, uh, is he observing a malaria sample or a leprosy sample? But many of you know that Gandhi played a very important role in destigmatizing leprosy in India. And one of the important things that I value in this photograph is his adoption to the scientific method. Although this is during the non-cooperation movement and uh, you know there is this moment and you can see his adoption and his understanding of science and the importance of science reflected. Uh, I started thinking about this and I also realized many microscopes haven't changed since the 1940s. This is really what microscopes look like even today uh, from a context of clinical work. And since that time, we've been building a large class of tools to bring microscopy both in an educational context and in a medical context. And I'll very briefly talk about a new tool that we have released from a context of medicine and then end with talking briefly about the societal context uh, with Foldscope. So I think of scientific tools as a spectrum. So what you can see on the very left are extremely low cost tools, which is Foldscope that anybody can get for a dollar or two all the way to Octopi, which is a $100 instrument that I'll talk very briefly about, that allows us to do now automated imaging. And this is in the context of malaria. I don't have to tell you how important this problem is. Ironically, when you look at malaria and TB, they are slow pandemics that take more lives than a pandemic like COVID. But if you look at the budget that's dedicated to many of these diseases, it's so much smaller than what has happened, for example, of all the research that's gone in COVID. So one of my hopes is that after this pandemic, we will take a deep look just ourselves as a society and ask ourselves a question, is why have we not prioritized these slow pandemics? And of course, the environmental catastrophe is another slow pandemic to think about. So this is much of this work is done in Kalahandi in Orissa. This is one of the uh, pockets, a tribal community uh, where we work with uh, Swasta Swaraj and several other NGOs, and we are trying to evaluate the efficacy of malaria diagnostics in an automated manner using a microscopy tool we call Octopi. And I have to show you this video. This is literally in one of these villages uh, where one of the primary health centers exists. And I just want to give you a time lapse for many of you if you have never spent some time in a health clinic. This is what it looks like. Here are two lab technicians who work like this essentially 
12 to 14 hours a day sometimes with so many patients coming in. They're doing microscopy manually. They're doing uh, detection for malaria. And they are literally using a dye that was in Gimsa, which was invented more than 100 years ago. So why is it that such an important problem and we still have not changed our sets of practices? And again, this is really, some of it has to do with, uh, you know, making appropriate technologies that can scale, but some of it really also has to do with, we just have not spent enough time as scientific enterprises tackling some of these biggest challenges. We started thinking about this problem and we came up with what we call Octopi, which is a big brother of Foldscope, a completely automated, microscopy platform, uh, which could be modified for the kind of disease you're interested in. So for example, in the very middle, the two microscopes that you see are designed for malaria, but to the very right is designed specifically for TB. And then we took this approach in asking that some of this problem should be solved with the hardware, but some of this has to be solved with the chemistry. And we started scaling, and again, much of this work is posted on BioArchive that you can read. Uh, Octopi costs roughly around $100 to $200, and I'm just going to give a brief review of how they work and operate. Uh, They operate on a cell phone battery till eight hours. Uh, You can build uh, these, uh, much of these files. Everything is online. Uh, Everything about this tool is automated. So once I put the smear, uh, essentially the object is finding uh, a scan, and at this point it's running a dual scan of both fluorescence and bright field. And roughly in five minutes or something, this object would have scanned roughly around 15 million cells. Compared to what a regular manual worker does for half an hour, uh, they would scan somewhere around three to 4,000 cells. And one of the beauty of this tool is we were able to build spectroscopy. uh, And by essentially scanning for many number of dyes and looking at new kinds of dyes, uh, we made a discovery that now allows us to identify different types of cells in uh, in a patient's blood just using spectral shifts. So one of the examples here is that you can see uh, platelets and uh, parasites here, uh, but now in a different color And one of this actually comes from the physics and the biochemistry behind this is we are rather than just observing an object, we are essentially observing the ratio of DNA to RNA in this cell. And based on that, we can identify and map it to what type of cell it is. Uh, And this really allows us to now do automated diagnostics for malaria in the field uh, at a fairly low cost. And one of the things that I'm excited about taking this project in a direction of just like what Fred Whipple had done for Operation Moonwatch, to build a large consortium of research institutes, medical institutes across the globe. And the reason I'm excited about pitching this is I've been working uh, both in Latin America and Africa to build partner organizations to release this tool. And I'm very excited. So if some of you are interested in building on new applications on Octopi, please do reach out to me because I am looking for partners to deploy this. The only requirement is that you would be joining an open network, so you would be sharing your data and the kinds of questions you're interested in. But as long as that's true, uh, we would like to build essentially a cohort of around 100 institutes around the world that are implementing the same platform, but for many different applications. And of course, sharing data and knowledge collectively, because one of the big aspects of this work is associated with machine learning, and especially bringing the kinds of uh, real world samples to a tool like this. Okay, so I maybe have two more minutes and I wanna take the time. uh, uh, Maybe I'll skip this, but if some of you are interested in aquatic ecosystems, we've also released a new tool we call Plankton Scope, which is again, another tool that costs roughly around $100, $150 to build. But what is powerful about this tool is it essentially does automated imaging in liquid samples. So if you say you're interested in stool samples or you're interested in uh, sewage analysis or interested in the health across of our aquatic ecosystems across the Ganges, you can literally build and deploy this tool which can autonomously collect in two to five minutes, again, 10 to uh, 50,000 cells 
And what's powerful about this tool is it generates these ecograms where literally after 10 minutes, I get this picture of all possible microbes. And of course, uh, this is not molecular information, but morphological information, but there is an incredible amount of information associated with this and the capacity to starting to map ecosystems in this manner in an automated uh, case is what we are really excited about. Okay, so I'm going to jump to just briefly mention a word about Foldscope because I know many of you have been involved in the journey of Foldscope. Uh, Foldscope started with a very simple question is how do we give access of all of these technologies that I'm talking about, how do we give it access to every single person on the planet? And that really is a difficult question to think about because we are talking about billions of people. And in, before even designing the tool, we put a price point on that, uh, which was supposed to be a dollar. It ended up now, uh, Foldscope is available to all communities around the world for $1.75. Uh, much of the technical aspects of this is described before, but I'm going to share with you just a, a philosophical note on what ended up happening in the community. Often enough, when we were thinking about deploying Foldscope, uh, of course, you can collect uh, biological data with this tool using your cell phones, with your eye, you can use it in a projection mode. Uh, but one of the things that I was worried about early on is we knew we could manufacture microscopes. I just didn't know that we could manufacture mentors. And mentors belong in communities, scientific communities, and many of you who are listening who have participated in Foldscope programs are really at the heart of much of this. It was a time when we had written this paper, uh, I had a, almost a, a sporadic reaction where I said, what if we deployed 50,000 Foldscope and just gave them to people around the world? It was a big what if because most people I told that idea kind of laughed at us saying, you know, unless you have a question in mind, what would you like to study? Why would you spend so much time and money and effort? And to me, it was very simply demonstrating that we could provide access to people. And that led to around 70,000 people writing to us requesting full scopes from around 130 countries at that time. And we just took the time for two years building and sharing these instruments to communities around the world. And that was the spark of an idea that led to essentially what is now the world's largest microscopy community, roughly a million users around the world spread across, uh, you know, across countries, across continents. And one of the beauty of much of this is the work that is done by the communities and especially Foldscope is both owned and driven by those communities. And exactly going back to that professional and amateur scientists working together, one of the things that I'm very proud of that that, that moment actually came true. There is hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, scientific publications on Foldscopes. Uh, uh, it's almost to a point that uh, it's become uh, an object uh, where people use Foldscope as a verb sometimes. I don't know if some of you have seen there is a Bernie meme floating around around Foldscope. Uh, but one of the most important things for me has been is what the community has been able to do and document. So if some of you go to this community website, microcosmos.foldscope.com, you can actually see much of that work. And I am especially proud of our engagement and programs across India. Uh, this came through from a tweet. Uh, I had posted about Foldscope and I got a tweet from the Prime Minister's scientific advisor, Dr. Vijay, uh, whether we would be interested in deploying a program in India that led to a remarkable connection with uh, Dr. Shelja and many of her staff at DBT, which led to this entire program. And to me, this has been the most joyful scientific journey that I have been, is this program in India. Because literally, we have been able to, as a community, empower hundreds and thousands of kids and adults across India to really explore science for the first time in a very meaningful and deep manner. And some of the examples that are posted, and again, I realize I'm already over an hour, are so remarkable that when I go back and look at them, I realize how brilliant 
the individuals that have been engaged. Uh, there is a beautiful program on training farmers in Chhattisgarh on many of the diseases uh, that are associated with uh, plant pathogens. Uh, some of the context of thinking about veterinary science has been extremely important. <laughs> These are elephants being diagnosed for different diseases. And of course, a no full scope talk would be complete without that mentioning uh, one of the most prominent full scope super user in the world. Uh, and actually, I'm proud to say this, that Mo Pandirajan crossed. I used to have the most number of posts on Microcosmos, and it's a very proud moment to say that a school teacher who I met long time ago, Mo Pandirajan, crossed the number of posts that I had some time ago now and happens to be the most prolific full scope user in the world right now. And actually, after English, much of our content uh, that is in the full scope website is actually in Tamil. As a single individual over the last four years, Mo has trained wow. roughly 95 to 100,000 kids across the country. And that to me is just so empowering in thinking about from the very humble beginnings of a project that a single individual, when given the right kind of tools, can actually impact communities in such a large manner, just to me, uh, was really unimaginable. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, there is a lot of advances that are coming through. There is a new Foldscope app that we have just recently released. Uh, there is a lot of machine learning tools that are coming in online. Uh, but I want to leave you with this picture, which Mo took for a while, uh, just as a way to contemplate for you to think about every time you are developing a class of technologies, think about what is the role of society and how would society engage with that tool and technology? And how can you empower a much larger group of people than just the scientific community to actually explore that tool, explore the various facets of that tool and empower them to be a part of your scientific journey such that you, know, you don't have to tackle these questions all alone, you could actually tackle them together. So on that, I am going to stop here. If anybody wants to reach me, here is my email. Uh, look at the several sets of uh, websites that are associated and I'm going to stop sharing and uh, we can transition if there is time I can take some questions. But thank you so much for listening for almost an hour. It is very strange to talk to a computer screen for an hour, uh, but uh, thank you so much for some of you who have stayed along all this time. Back to you Anshu and Sanjeev. Yes, well, I must say it's inspired. That's, that's all I can say about it. It's really inspired. And uh, thank you so much for taking us through the journey from wonders of nature to science, innovation, and health, education, and environment. It's amazing. And I'm sure, like me, many of you have questions uh, uh, for Manu. So if, if there are questions, please go ahead and ask them. Uh. I think so. If people can uh, uh, raise their hand, there is a button which uh, by which you can raise their hands. It will be easier for us to moderate it. Yeah. Yeah, Amit, go ahead. You are mute. Yeah, uh, Manu, thanks a lot for such an inspiring lecture. Uh, it's just amazing the breadth of knowledge that you have and uh, the scientific questions that you are asking uh, in your lab every day and then taking back to the community. I think it, it's really inspiring and I'm so glad that, uh, I mean, I have met you previously, heard you many times, but today it was uh, really a um, uh, very inspiring lecture. Thank you for your time. So my question to you is like every time when I'm working in the lab, um, you know, you talked about environment. So one thing that haunts me is the append of tubes, which we, you know, once after we put a sample, we just throw it away. Yeah. Uh, that is something, you know, that that really, you know, uh, se se several times I keep like, like, for example, the mini prep columns that we use small, you know, and especially during the COVID times when we were preparing the viral RNA samples, we were using these uh, Kaijan columns, you know, um, and that there was a lot of trash being generated in the lab. 
and there was i had no way I, I, it really struck me like how to reuse them you know we are just throwing these plastics and we don't know as you said 98% of their life cycle we don't know so you know is there something that you are thinking on those lines in uh, i i'm pretty sure you must be doing that but any thoughts on that no i think I, yeah i can definitely mention something which is extremely important in this perspective and something i forgot to mention uh, i'll share my screen for a second so uh, over the pandemic i was thinking about teaching a class of how to share this philosophy much more broadly and so i taught this class uh, i called frugal science it was a completely open class it was free to everybody roughly around 150 to 170 students signed up across the globe uh, and one of the big things that we started doing is building this dashboard of classes of problems and that led to a problem dashboard plus sets of teams globally on many projects around the world all the way you know from uh, biodiversity mapping of ants to, and one of those teams, the reason I brought this up uh, is uh, lab waste. Uh, and what's very interesting about these classes of problems that I feel in frugal science, the scale of the problem is so large that there is no one individual or one team can actually tackle this. I mean, we are really talking about just such an enormous scale and it's a failure of imagination in some sense, because as designers, as designer of technology, we often don't think about the last mile. I mean, I build and design diagnostic tools and there is value that you put in something, but there's no environmental cost that we put in. And so I think one of the big things that I've been thinking about uh, is how to make sure that we can build global teams around these large scale uh, issues, because in the end, of course, there are market-driven solutions, but there are also behavior solutions. And there's somewhere in the middle is the right approach. Because <laughs> sometimes the if it's just the market-driven solution, the the most the cheapest column will win. But that might not be the right because you're not including the environmental cost into it. And so I think I'm very excited about these global teams and especially coming up with a mechanism post the pandemic because we've now realized that we can all talk to each other via Zoom and it's perfectly fine. <laughs> you know, it's as almost as good as being there. And my hope is that we will be able to build global teams to tackle some of these challenges. And I think uh, the engineering community, the scientific community uh, is quite excited about this capacity. But one of the things we have to do is how do we take this uh, post-pandemic energy and focus on problems like that you just described. Because again, we could go back to business as usual and most of these environmental challenges will not appear to be, uh, you know, as problematic as they truly are. Okay. Um, so there is a presentation uh, yeah. on this website that you can watch that talks a little bit about our approach to this. Okay. Uh, Anshu, there are a couple of questions that are coming to me through Twitter uh, because I think some of the students have heard over there. So, uh, one student is asking you, Manu, um, can you can you please tell us how you balance your basic science and applied science activities in the lab, and what is your favorite discovery so far? <laughs> yeah, no, you never say who's your favorite child. You can get in trouble for that. Uh, I think I'll, I'll mention something about basic and applied. I truly think they are uh, two sides of the same coin and I I live by that every day. So this is not just some philosophical note because most often when I'm thinking about a problem because it's just interesting, I have absolutely no idea whether it will be useful, but it will get filed in my head for many years and even a decade would pass by and suddenly you realize, remember I read that or I had seen that before and you flip it around and suddenly it becomes a technology or a solution. Similarly, the other way around, most often I'll be thinking about a really fundamental problem, but I just don't have the right tools to tackle it. And I'll be thinking about this applied question that I'd be trying to solve and suddenly appears a tool that has not been used in this perspective. So. I think the simplest way of mentioning this is we have to broaden our horizons. Uh, you know, science is so explorative and so large in its sense, you really have to not penalize yourself for wasting time. 
you know, waste time. Uh, every Friday in the lab, we have a rule where just, you know, you do the Friday night experiments, which are just have nothing to do with your thesis, have nothing to do with your scientific goals. I do a lot of science at home. Now I do it with my kids and actually it shapes how I think. I do a lot of microbiology at home. It's not so hard to actually build a biology lab at home as long as you make sure that the bugs that you're bringing in are, uh, you know, uh, not too dangerous. Uh, but I think you have to practice this. It's very easy to say. It's very hard to do. And, uh, you know, don't judge yourself for your productivity. Judge yourself for your happiness in science. And, you know, as long as uh, you can meet the minimum requirements of, and people don't uh, kick you out, I think, which is kind of what happened in my case, uh, you know, I, I really get a lot of joy out of connecting ideas together. Amit, are there more questions on Twitter? Amit, yeah. 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 So, and not not right now, uh, but if there are any, I will ask. But in the meantime, other participants can ask. Yeah, uh, can I let my curiosity overpower me? And, uh, let me ask a question. I'm really impressed the breadth of knowledge that you actually gave us, and uh, it's fantastic. Uh, really impressed. Uh, I had two questions. Uh, one is more of an applied thing that you been doing and one is curiosity one. I'll start with the applied one. So uh, you talked about detection of viruses uh, in the, the mosquitoes uh, the bite. Yeah. Uh, uh, keeping that in mind, have you ever thought of actually uh, doing something by which you can actually de detect whether it's a bacteria or a virus? Mm -hmm. That. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's that's a fantastic question. And one of the threads that we have been looking at is, uh, again, building a platform technology. So the chips that I described, they kind of look like business cards. Uh, they are primarily sample collection chips. And then in a centralized facility, they couple to another chip that now allow us to either run a sequencing type of an analysis or a bacterial versus viral assay or very specifically just looking for dengue, for example. So by, by splitting this technology into pieces, the front end and the back end, uh, what we were able to do is build a back end that's completely general purpose. And once we share this, uh, anybody else would have the chance to essentially expand on that work. And especially, you know, with the role of bacteria and mosquitoes, especially Wolbachia and many other things, we're very interested in surveillance of, uh, and especially native populations. Because I think one, one bias that we have in science is we feel once you establish something in the lab, we believe that's how it works in the environment. And that's a really big mistake because there are so many variants and often enough, it's not even possible for us, for example, if I was to even think about, there are so many questions we can ask with this tool by ourselves, we will never be able to explore those many questions. But as tool makers, we can share the tools in a manner that are accessible to people, and then suddenly the sky is the limit, and much, many a times people come up with ideas that you have never thought about. Uh. Can I can I ask another one? <laughs> yeah. So so uh, uh, go back to your first few slides. Uh, you talked about the contraction in five milliseconds. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so how many times does this contract and expand in a in a period of time? Yeah. So in the lifetime of the organism, uh, it's reversible which is quite remarkable. So it's not a one shot. There are many organisms like spores, for example, or uh, many plant cells that store hygroscopically certain tension and they'll pop just once. Here is a system that can reversibly do this. It takes some time. So if it contracts in five milliseconds, it will take a few tens of seconds before it can contract again. So the relaxation happens slowly and contraction happens fast but it's a purely reversible event. And I forgot to mention this. This is actually related to toxins. Uh, what is happening in the system is this contraction 
is releasing toxins from the surface of this cell into its environment rapidly. And what the system is doing is the toxin a single cell can produce is small enough to deter a large predator. But if all cells could contract simultaneously, they collectively release toxins that can then deter this predator. So this collective communication is not just a panic mode run away. They are collectively releasing a chemical agent and that chemical agent is what's essentially saving them. So evolutionarily, it's a really important strategy to be able to communicate. And this is why we believe they, uh, they live in clusters. Uh, it's one of the largest ciliate. It can grow to be four millimeter. A single cell can grow to be that large, which also implies that it can be eaten and seen by many other predators. So you have to deal with much larger predators like copepods and other things. And so, uh, this whole toxin story is actually quite interesting because it goes back to this notion that you have to keep doing this over and over again through your lifetime. And the speed of contraction is related to the speed of attack. If you don't react fast enough, then it's not useful. Okay. Great. So I think we can uh, take one last question uh, from Dr. Manoj. Uh, Manu, it's really great. It's really fascinating talk. I'm hearing such a talk after long. <laughs> so I really appreciate uh, your efforts which you have put into, and that's, I think, the motto of every scientist, uh, to see a problem and to finally, you know, come up solution, right, which the society can enjoy. I highly appreciate your efforts for that. So we are primarily working in this, uh, viral diseases and also at the same time machine learning. So gels well with some of your thoughts which we are working on. So particularly interested in the viral surveillance in India, like yeah. the worked on dengue, which are very yeah. important problem in the country. So the chips which you are talking about. So we will be uh, looking forward how we can collaborate on that aspect so that we can implement in the surveillance program uh, for the same. Yeah. And because not only dengue, but the JE and many other, particularly in different parts of the country, we have this problem. So we would be, I would be really interested in that aspect. And also a lot of image you are generating. So of course you are also doing machine learning. So we would yeah. be happily, you know, willing to collaborate on that aspect where we could use AI and other things to, you know, come up with the uh, predictive algorithms also for us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think just mentioning this, the reason I was thinking about also when Tulsi reached out to me, Amit, was the, uh, I think sometimes for us, when the most important aspect is to not work in isolation, I am extremely interested in many of these tools being used in many different manners and especially very quickly being validated in the field setting as well. So I think there are so many things to explore. And now since today, I have learned a lot more about the Institute itself. Uh, and so I think I'm hoping this gives us an opportunity uh, to plan sets of things. So just feel free to write to me. Uh, I would be very happy uh, to engage and especially share the sets of tools we make. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Manu. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Anshu, uh, thanks. Anshu. Anshu. Yeah, yeah, Anshu, if you don't mind, can we take some more questions? Uh, there are participants who want to ask Manu. Uh, we can take two, three more questions. Yes, I think we should. Yeah, definitely. Yes, we should take more. Uh, Rashmi, you want to ask? Yeah, I was thinking the uh, Amit has some people from the Twitter. Amit, were you referring to Twitter or were you referring to? Uh, no, no, to it's our... in the in the uh, in the uh, in the participant list only. I think Rashmi wants to ask a question, and then maybe a Ravi. Uh, so they are just messaging me. Uh, so that's why I said that you know. Well, we'll go ahead and yeah, yeah. please go ahead, Rashmi, and then uh, Ravi. Hi, uh, I'm actually I'm sitting with Rashmi. <laughs> so this is Bina here. Uh, thanks, Manu. That was so, so exciting and just brought me back to, you know, childhood curiosity. That is my favorite concept that you talked about. Uh, so I have a slightly different question for you. So when you have an idea and you are building together a team, right? Uh, 
I know there may not be a magic formula to put together, you know, a team that will definitely make your idea fly and bring it to success. But since you have worked on so many different concepts, is there something that you can tell us? Uh, so when we are putting together a team, you know, how to probably motivate people and have them trust your idea and work together as a team. Uh, just your thoughts. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, you're asking a very important and a slightly difficult question uh, because, you know, as scientists, we are human. We have all the prejudices, we have all the sets of challenges, you know, the set of, sometimes we get so attached to an idea that we miss the point uh, of a turning point and something else that was very interesting. I think for me personally, uh, I don't think too much about this notion of motivation, uh, primarily for a very simple reason, because I believe that, uh, you know, an honest engagement in science uh, leads to people internally having their own compass of why we all do what we do. I mean, of course, I have the chance to work with a majority of my work is with young students. Uh, and one of the perspectives there is uh, that I get a chance to choose the kind of students that I'll have in my lab. But beyond that, the thing that I care about when I'm thinking about this is to make sure that we have the breadth of knowledge represented in the team. So many times I have in my lab biochemists, I have pure applied mathematicians, I have mechanical engineers, students that come from a broad range. And just personally, when we all come together, it's not a transaction. We are not trying to say, hey, let's divide up the project in 15 different bins and you do this and you do this. We're just coming all to the table to say, look, this is what we are trying to solve. Here is one way. And again, I think I'm thinking about something. It might be a good idea, a bad idea. All ideas are open on the table. But then all of us have to take ownership of thinking about that. And again, what it means is the a molecular biologist will come halfway through and learn the kind of mathematical tools and a mathematician will come and learn halfway through because in the future, both of them then are also trained to be thinking about these things simultaneously. So I think science is not a transaction. And it's very important that the biggest thing that you said there already is a sense of trust. So, you know, <laughs> and trust just comes from working together. I also don't like building large teams. Once an idea has worked, then we can release it and very large group of people around the world can in a distributed manner test and implement them. But then the ownership belongs to them. Uh, I think sometimes just very large teams, it's very hard to do something extremely creative because how are you going to convince people on, a, on an idea that doesn't have a proof? And that's when you get into these motivations. So I've just, I mostly work with one or two students maximum for all our projects at the core. And then when we are in the very end, we need help. We can engage more students to kind of finish up a manuscript or something. But there is, there is a little bit of a, a kind of a bias personally for me. And again, that's much more of a style and just what works for all of us. Uh, you know, we often don't put such a large penalty on failure, for example, which is very hard to do in academia because uh, often enough, you know, when you fail, we fail catastrophically. Uh, and if you can normalize that somehow in the institute or in our groups, then then it's OK. And again, you know, then you kind of feel that it's OK to go on a limb, try something. And if it doesn't work, it's not such a big cost that you have to pay. Because you're thinking about the long game in some sense, not just so I never ask my students of, you know, you have to graduate in X number of years. I mean, it, it's it's uh, it's much more plastic. Yeah, I think I mean there's no magic solution other than just when you try this and it works a couple of times, you keep up the good mechanisms and you remove the ones that didn't work. Thank you. Uh, hi, Manu. Ravi Mishra here. Go ahead, Ravi. Thanks for the wonderful talk. So my curiosity is about that uh, contradiction and reduction mechanism. Uh, yes. 
any understanding about the genetic or epigenetic factors which are controlling this in the community? Yeah, so I think a couple of interesting things. I'll mention a few things we understand and a few we don't. Uh, first of all, uh, this is really, you have to first ask, what is the molecular motor? This might be the example of one of the fastest molecular motor. And so we've been looking at that. And one of the key insights that we have that it is not an ATP driven motor. It's actually possibly a calcium driven motor. And there is a class of molecules uh, called centrins that are found in many roles. You know, again, uh, for many of the cytoskeleton people, you might be excited about it from centrosomes. And But we find centrins in the cortical cytoskeleton of this cell patterned like a helix. And centrin has a very interesting property. Uh, it's actually similar to calmodulin and several other uh, molecules that essentially with and without binding of calcium, they can show a contraction. But the centrin forms a filament. And the reason this can occur in such a short time scale is because of a calcium influx into the cell. So that that pulse is really fast and that could lead to a giant contraction. And then the relaxation actually comes from the microtubule cytoskeleton. So there is this antagonistic really fast contraction and then an elastic response to expansion. So that's just the mechanism. And again, there is a lot to be figured out in this. But the other aspect that you said uh, on, there's a lot of behaviors we don't understand. First of all, these cells cluster on their own. There must be a kind of a quorum sensing mechanism in them uh, for them to cluster. Uh, they find each other in these little groups, uh, even in an ecosystem while they're moving around. And then, of course, one of the important things you have to remember is how do you tune what is the kind of amount of... In nature, there are so many stimuli. So if you are so finicky, imagine, I mean, this contraction, think of it as jitteriness. If you're so jittery that any amount of cue, you'll keep jittering and you'll keep wasting your toxin. So I find this quite interesting, is how do you tune yourself to be safeguarded that when you need it, you will contract, but you also don't wastefully contract because the toxin production has a cost. And so if this toxin production has a cost, how do you go about from an evolution to find a balance between your, how do you tune your sensory capabilities? And again, I think it is possible, we've been thinking about growing them in turbulent water and see that if we provide them a lot of hydrodynamic signal, for example, they're aquatic, they could be in a stream that has more signal, mechanical signal, would they tune and learn to not be so jittery? Because they have learned the fact that, oh, just because that there is a lot of the signal coming in from my environment, it doesn't mean it's a predator every time. So I think there are certain aspects of questions of learning we're interested in. But again, what might be the molecular mechanism? We're very far. We're really trying to first build an assay that we can train them to contract at a given critical stress or strain. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, Dr. Sanjeev, would you, would you like to say a few words before we move to the formal board of thanks? Yeah, no, uh, I just, uh, <laughs> I'm still, uh, uh, one fantastic, <laughs> I don't have any words to uh, say, it's a really, really, um, it's really uh, a learning curve for me. Uh, you talking about these, uh, uh, these uh, movements, sudden movements, uh, actually, uh, if, I, I think so. You should come to Imtech. We'll we'll show you lots of things we could actually discuss. Lots, lot more of these things. We, I myself uh, have lots of observations that I would really love to get yeah. your uh, feedbacks on. And I think so. A lot of my colleagues would be really benefited out of uh, your uh, experience. So, I think so. I'll not take too much of uh, the time and you uh, you go ahead with the formal thing but thanks a lot manu and it really really good experience here Anshu, yeah. all right so thanks uh, dr sanjeev khosla for that
So see, my learnings from the lecture were creative thinking, sensitivity to nature, open collaborations, strong science, and then practice, practice, practice. And I think this is something that uh, our speaker has been trying to explain us through several examples you know, to all the young students out there and for all of us as well. I think that's a very strong message, which is going to not just sail us through the pandemic, but through every challenge that we are going to we are facing now and we are going to face in the future. So I, I think that's the take home message. And on behalf of uh, Director uh, C.A.S.A. Tech and Tech family, I would like to really formally thank uh, Dr. Manu Prakash for uh, being here and being uh, available for discussion and sharing his life's history and how he thinks and what are you know uh, what what the gen next uh, scientist should be, and that that's I think a very very important message. And I would really like to thank Dr. Amit Tuli for having you here. So without Amit, you know, we would not have the opportunity to listen to you. So thanks Amit for doing this. Uh, really, really appreciate that. And like to also place on record thanks to Dr. Sanger, the ITBIC team for the audiovisual and hosting of the event. Uh, you don't see them, but yeah, the none of this is possible without their constant engagement and support. And thank everyone who has joined us via Facebook and you, uh, on YouTube. Uh, for us to celebrate the 37th CSAR Intech Foundation Day. I wish you a very nice day and I wish a very good night to Dr. Prakash and hopefully a healthy year ahead for all of us. And with that, I would like to say bye bye and formally close the event. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank, thank you, Manu. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.